We join Ayla Paul of Reading University at the beginning of her talk on the geographic origin and authenticity of UK honey samples as she discusses the significance of hydrogen and oxygen isotopes to her work. Both isotopes uh, do show relationships between precipitation, like rainwater, um, and the geographic origin of foodstuffs. Um, there's numerous examples out there of studies where the um, isotopic ratios of foodstuffs um, show a significant relationship with the geographic origin of those samples, like in olive oil, wines, uh, and also in honey. Um, and carbon isotopes are also used to detect uh, adulteration. Uh, we did measure those in almost all samples, but I won't go into too much detail about those in this presentation. Um, but we did measure them all. Let's go look at the next one, uh, trace elements. So differences in trace elements and rare earth elements are also related to botanical and geographic origin. Um, studies from other areas in the world have shown that differences in these metal concentrations in honey uh, from different countries show a strong influence of the area of the origin of the chemical composition. Um, so we're looking at this into, in relation to UK honey too, to see how these um, elements create, if they create kind of fingerprint for um, the UK honey samples too. So let's start where this started um, three and a half years ago. Uh, I obviously had to go and acquire some samples. So what do you do if you don't know any beekeepers nor know anything about beekeeping at all? Um, I contacted my, uh, my local beekeeping associations that I could find. Um, so obviously the university is based in Reading, so I contacted the Reading uh, and District Beekeepers Association and I myself live in um, Burnham next to Slough, so I also contacted the Slough Windsor Mainhead Beekeeper Society uh, and both are very enthusiastic to, um, to help me with my research, so I particularly want to um, thank Claire on the left who um, helped me with my research and Joy on the right and Alpash from Burnham as well. Who, um, who all kindly helped me um, uh, get some of my samples from their hives. Um, I also acquired samples from other beekeepers all over the UK from known locations uh, to postcode level. Um, I know some beekeepers um, are quite protective of their hives because, um, because of fraud, stealing, theft, whichever. Um, so I was happy for it to be just postcode level for my research if they just wanted to share the postcode. Um, if they didn't want to um, disclose the exact location of their hive. Um, and then we got in touch with them either online or through farmers markets. Um, and basically we got everybody on board in our whole department. So anybody who went abroad or somewhere, um, a nice location during a field class or on holiday was asked if they could bring me back a, a sample from a local beekeeper. Um, and a lot of my colleagues did reply to that. So I have a honey from Mount Etna. Um, I brought several back from Iceland. I've got some from Vietnam and Canada, um, which greatly helped with um, getting um, a wide range of samples for my research. So even though this study concerns UK honey, and I should, I should clarify that when I say UK, I mean UK and Ireland, because it's one landmass. So I decided to keep it um, UK and Ireland, as in Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, we also acquired samples outside of the, of the UK um, just to confirm our results, but also to look at it at a, at a broader scale and um, see how the UK samples compare to those. So then what you do, you get in a bee suit for the first time yourself, which was quite scary um, because the, um, the hives that I visited uh, how bees all from different sort of temperaments so um, it was um, quite the experience. Um, the right hand picture is um, some of Joy's hives um, that you see there in a very nice location uh, so very much enjoyed um, seeing it all up close and um, experiencing um, beekeeping oh, even if it's only for a short um, period of time um, which is very exciting. After the um, uh, visiting the hives, I would bring back the um, samples to um, 
the lab. So you can see some of the samples there on the left um, and my face again on the right in the lab. Um, and we see here, this is um, the microbalance, which I use to um, weigh out my samples for the mass spectrometer. Um, we're going to see some up close pictures later on as well, how detailed that needs to be. Um, but I spent hours and hours and hours in this tiny little lab where you can't have a window open because of the microbalance. So it was quite hot in summer, but I survived because I'm here now. Um, so um, we're going to have a look at that later as well. So let's start with uh, pollen at the beginning. So uh, in my um, full set of samples, I have to say I've got over 200 different samples in my lab. Um, we didn't use all of them um, for my for our final analyses, and it might be that some of them were blended or we couldn't um, identify um, to postcode level where the honey was come from, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there was one um, owner of honey who um, kindly let us have her DNA analysis she had done by this C by CEH, the um, Center for Ecology and Hydrology, which now runs the honey monitoring scheme. Um, she had some very detailed analysis of her honey samples, and we were able to um, get the exact same samples um, counted for the pollen as well using um, traditional microscope. Um, it's much more detailed information than the National Honey Monitoring Scheme sends out. Um, so that's why we only stuck to these eight for this um, small comparison. Um, and these samples were all counted um, through the microscope up to 500 grains um, to then compare to the, um, to the DNA analysis that we were given um, that belonged to these samples as well. So the, um, the slides were all counted by Susie Richer. Um, using her vast knowledge and experience as an environmental archaeologist. Uh, she specializes in uh, pollen analysis too. Um, I tried to um, learn it all myself. Um, I've spent a lot of time looking through the microscope, uh, trying to identify all the pollen grains, and I did the um, workshop at the um, National Honey Show. But in the end, I just had to um, call defeat and acknowledge that it wasn't going to be my expertise and for me to get high quality data uh, for my PhD, I just had to um, get somebody else on board who could do the counting for me. Um, so that's why I didn't end up counting the, um, the pollen slides myself. Um, but I did have a, a look through the microscope for um, quite a few slides, but we've, we've not used my own data. So we're now going to look at the comparison between uh, the DNA and the uh, traditional counting through the microscope. Um, there were eight samples, so these are four that um, came from the south. So we've got Surrey, London, Sussex and Berkshire. Um, and we can see here that um, I, I sorted them by, um, these are percentages and just the top five families for each uh, method used, um, how much they uh, were present in the, um, the samples with the dark blues. So the dark blues are the traditional counting and the lighter blues are DNA. Um, so you see that the, um, the families identified by, um, by both methods are, are very different, well not very different. Um, most of them, they do show a similarity, rosacea were here, um, almost the same amount. And here both methods identify as the, um, the family um, with the largest um, representation in the sample. Um, here you see that there the brassica is, um, um, is identified in DNA, but almost not present uh, through traditional microscope. And again, here a, a discrepancy too. So it looks like both methods um, identify different families at different um, um, levels. Um, and um, and the same is true for the other uh, four samples too. So we've also got, I say mid and north, one of them is actually not that myth or mid or north, but I had to divide it up somehow. So we've got Yorkshire, Suffolk, Lincolnshire and Essex here. Um, Lincolnshire here is obviously very, um, very much uh, an example of all the same family by both methods. And then a few extras, um, that both methods uh, identify differently. Um, Yorkshire, 
was a head of honey, um, which the Melissa Palinology identified mostly um, as one, one, of one family, whilst the DNA didn't pick up as a uh, higher percentage as that um, at all. Um, so it's interesting to see how, how all eight differ a lot, and, but do still show similarities. Um, but it does show that neither or, nor could be used as the true representation of what uh, pollen types are present inside the sample. Um, so if we look at how many pollen families were identified in numbers, um, we see here the, the Melissa palynology, so the traditional uh, counting through the microscope. Then we've got here DNA analysis, how many families they uh, identified, and then the combined. So you see there is some overlap, but there is still some that were identified in DNA um, um, and not in Melissa palynology and vice versa. Um, so it's very interesting to keep this in mind when we when we look at other data as well is how we how we might combine this into um, in future development of of um, identified, identifying um, where a honey sample has come from in the UK and which method we use um, to make that judgment. So let's move on to hydrogen and oxygen isotopes. Um, so let's start at the very beginning. What is an isotope? Um, an isotope is one of more or uh, two or more forms of the same chemical element. So different isotopes of an element have the same number of protons in the nucleus. This is the nucleus here. Giving them the same atomic number, but a different number of neutrons, giving the, each element elemental isotope, sorry, a different atomic weight. So there are lighter and heavier isotopes of the same element. So for example, here on the left, we got two uh, hydrogen isotopes. So this is hydrogen, which got one proton here in the nucleus. So this, the atomic weight is one. So this is the lighter form of hydrogen. And then here on the right, we've got deuterium, which has got one proton and one neutron. Um, so one and one makes two. So this is deuterium, which is let's say two hydrogens got an atomic weight of two so this is the heavier form of hydrogen um, if we then look at the oxygen isotopes um, same story again there's eight protons here in the nucleus and eight protons here in the nucleus too however this isotope for oxygen has only got eight neutrons so this is together eight and eight makes 16 so this is 16 l and then we've got um, eight protons and 10 neutrons in the nucleus here. So eight and 10 makes 18. So this is um, 18 oxygen isotope. So this is the lighter one and this is the heavier one. So those are the isotopes that we're looking at. So there's both a lighter and a heavier form of um, each isotope that we analyze. So what has that got to do with my research? Um, so oxygen and hydrogen isotopes um, are present in the uh, in the water cycle. Um, so we've got oceanic water here that evaporates and it forms a cloud which then travels inland. Um, uh, the heavier isotopes occur pref um, preferen preferentially in uh, in liquid or solid phase, and the light isotopes in the gaseous phase. And then when this air mass is starting to travel um, inland, precipitation comes down, but the heavier isotopes will fall out before the lighter isotopes or faster. Um, so the heavier isotopes are basically distilled from the cloud. So therefore the ratio of heavy to light isotopes in precipitation falling from the air um, decreases with time as more and more water is lost in precipitation. So it means that the further inland you go, and the higher in altitude you go, the lighter the isotopes are. So we've got very heavy here and then very light up here. So because this is um, um, a, a relationship that uh, we can measure, uh, it makes it that we can um, predict which isotopes we might find on any place uh, on Earth. Um, so the University of Utah has created an online model called the uh, Online Isotope, OIPC, Online 
isotopes in precipitation calculator. Sorry, I had to think there. Um, which basically you can put any location you want uh, coordinates um, online uh, and then it will tell you exactly what the um, um, oxygen and hydrogen isotopes would be for that um, particular location. Um, so we've used that data uh, to make um, an overview of what these oxygen and hydrogen isotopes and precipitation are for uh, all the locations of where our honey samples have come from. So the University of Utah uses um, measuring stations all around the world um, to create this worldwide map and keeps updating those as well. Um, so I hope that makes sense. And this is why we use oxygen and hydrogen isotopes in my research. Now we're gonna look at uh, fractionation. So this is how we're gonna go from precipitation that I just described to honey, which is what I'm researching. So we've got um, precipitation here that falls down onto the earth and then plants use both sunlight as well as rainwater um, um, and uses photosynthesis to create nectar, which then the bee forages um, and then they add enzymes uh, to put it into the hives. And when it comes into the hives, they evaporate it further um, and until it's ripe enough for us to um, extract it and then it becomes honey. So we've got this step and now we're measuring this step and um, we're gonna see how that relates to each other to see if we can um, um, create this isotopic uh, map of the UK for UK honey. So my lab work then, uh, 92 samples that I've included in the oxygen hydrogen isotope analysis, uh, four were blended, 59 from within the UK and Ireland, uh, 21 from the EU, including those four from Iceland, uh, and eight non-EU honeys. Um, so they were all measured and then measured in um, triplicates and then brought to the uh, mass spectrometer to um, get analyzed. So how would it look like in the lab? I promised you some extra pictures of uh, extra detail. Um, so we see here in my hand, there's this needle, um, which is actually thinner than a paper clip. Um, and then in this little hole here, you see a tiny little capsule. It's either um, silver if you measure oxygen hydrogen isotopes, or it's tin if you measure carbon nitrogen. Um, so this little capsule sits in that little hole over there. Then I use this needle to dip that into the honey and then only lightly touch the little capsule and then um, weigh it out to make sure I've got the right, right amount of honey. And then I fold it up tightly and then it goes in the mass spectrometer. So the weight of each sample of honey is only 0.2 milligrams. And that's why I needed the microbalance um, to measure out all those samples because 0.2 milligrams of honey is not even the end of um, a paper clip. So you can't make mistakes because there's no scooping it back out if you've got um, too much honey inside your little capsules. So the mass spectrometer, this is, uh, this is it. I can't make it more fancy than, um, than what the machine looks like. There's nothing to see. Everything happens on the inside. Um, but I did find um, a description of how to try and explain what the mass spec do, does in, um, in easy terms. So if somebody gives you a bucket full of atoms of different chemical elements and asks you what's inside, you can tip your bucket in the mass spec it turns the atoms into ions. Um, so they are electri electrically charged atoms with either too few or too many electrons. Then it separates the ions by passing them first through an electric field and then through a magnetic field. So they fan out in a spectrum. And then a computerized detector tallies the ions in different parts of the spectrum. And you can use this information to figure out what kind of atoms were originally in your bucket. Um, so when we analyze the samples on the mass spec, we also include um, international reference standards, um, which are basically materials that are of known isotopic ratios, um, which are um, internationally recognized and um, uh, used everywhere. Um, so we uh, add these, stand we call them standards, into as well, so then we can see if 
the machine has done the readings correctly of the samples. Um, I hope that makes sense. So let's go and look then, excuse me, what the um, precipitation isotopes look like for the UK and Ireland. So this is the map um, of precipitation isotopes. So these are based on um, the online database from the University of Utah. Um, and what I want to show here is that, um, like I tried to describe earlier, is that there is a high um, relationship between um, altitude and the um, precipitation values of the isotopes in both oxygen on the left and hydrogen on the right. Um, so we can see northern England and southern Scotland is quite orange, um, and then Southern Ireland is very blue, and then even uh, the final tip of the UK gets quite blue as well. So um, I, I don't need you to look at the um, measurements here, but just at the gradient and try to remember where um, the colors kind of were on the map. So it's mostly orange in the middle and then blue at the, um, the outskirts. So after I've measured all those isotopes, um, we're going to look at the relationship between the precipitation and the measured isotopes. Um, I know these graphs can be a little bit daunting, um, but the, um, the gray kind of shows the relationships with the trend line, um, and both uh, show the statistically significant relationship. So the, um, the measured isotopes in bulk honey is, um, versus the um, isotopes and precipitation, the relationship was significant. Um, but I can understand that this graph on its own might not mean much to you. So I've tried to highlight um, where different samples have come from, and it looks a bit messy on the next slide, but I'm going to walk you through it step by step. Here we go. Um, so we've got here, uh, top, top hand corner, uh, South Africa, Australia, so those are quite warm climates. Uh, we've got one here from Vietnam, and then we've got bottom here clustered together, Canada, Iceland, Austria, and it's the same pattern here. So this is, this is hydrogen, this is oxygen. Um, same here, Iceland and Canada uh, are on the far left, Australia and South Africa again on the far right. We've got Austria here, Vietnam here. Um, so it shows that the, the colder climates uh, plot completely on the left, a hotter climates completely on the right. Um, Austria is here because um, it's the sample that we got from the highest um, altitude out of the whole set. Uh, and altitude does um, influence the um, precipitation values and, and the um, isotopes present in the honey. Um, this Vietnam one is, is an outlier. Um, because in Vietnam they use honey very differently than other places around the world. world. Um, so in Vietnam they like to pour it as a, as a fairly liquid substance to put in their teas or other drinks. So they, they, they already extract the honey before we would consider it ripe. Um, so it's nowhere near as thick, so you can actually buy just like, um, um, excuse me, um, a 500 milliliter pet bottle um, and you can just pour it out very easily uh, to put in your drink. So we did analyze it and we kept it in the analysis to see where it plots, but I do have to say that that's kind of um, an outlier, but still interesting to see where it plots on the scale. Um, and then all these black ones in the middle that I haven't highlighted, um, they're basically all European and UK samples. Um, so it shows that the relationship is definitely good at detecting the extremes. Um, but there's still a lot of, lot of clutter that plots together here in, in the middle on both oxygen and hydrogen. So let's go and look at the um, isoscape for the measured um, honeys in, uh, sorry, the measured isotopes in the, in the honey. Um, so this is um, when you make an interpolation with ArcGIS, um, it basically draws a, a square around the outskirts of where your samples were. So it covers this area because you see this sample is right here on the edge and these are on the corners too. Um, so these are the maps for oxygen and hydrogen. Um, so if you can remember um, the first map I showed with the precipitation isotopes, the middle was kind of orange and then the bottom around here and here was getting more blue. Um, so we can sort of see a very similar gradient here 
which um, definitely the, the higher up here in the middle is all orangey and then some, some blueish at the bottom, which is promising because it shows that um, it might show a very similar gradient to the, um, the isotopes in precipitation of the same location. Um, and I've, um, and the black dots are obviously all the sampling locations of the samples that we used. I've also done the same for um, in Northern Europe uh, and included all the samples that um, um, we did for um, those ones. So you can see here that then Iceland becomes very red um, and then um, especially here on the hydrogen, uh, Italy is starting to become a little bit more blue. Um, the interpolation is, isn't the greatest method here to show you the, uh, the gradients, um, but I did want to show you how the differences looked like and that Iceland definitely shows very different um, um, uh, values, for example, the, to the UK. Um, and there is definitely something interesting going on in, the, in these um, maps altogether. Um, but it's still definitely, I mean, from one sample, is you can't really say that much for a whole country because I showed the, uh, the level of detail for the um, UK when you zoom in just to the UK, you can see there's much higher gradient. So the same would be true for France as well. If you were to zoom into France itself, it would show a different, different type of map um, if we had more samples. Um, but it's a start, you know, you have to start somewhere. And then uh, trace elements, we're looking at trace elements as well. Um, don't try and read the table. Uh, there's no need to. I don't want to scare you, don't worry. Uh, it's just there to show how much data there is for the trace elements. Um, we analyzed, or I analyzed 46 elements um, and then hundreds of samples. So there is uh, a lot of data that I have to um, plow through. Um, and I'm now grouping these to represent environmental conditions like geology and those that represent pollution um, and then going to see how they make their individual fingerprints for um, UK honey. Um, I've made a quick um, graph today to show the um, um, relationship between, for example, magnesium and calcium, um, which shows that uh, there is definitely a relationship there. Uh, which needs further investigating for the other elements as well um, to see how they all relate to each other and then link to the geographic origin of all these samples that I analyzed to see how um, how these relationships work. Um, so it's at least as good that the, the elements at least are related. Um, and now the big question, what does this all mean? Um, what I didn't say is when I said I sampled um, Claire's uh, bees, for example, in Reading, is that um, I didn't take honey of just one hive. There was, um, Claire had um, several, um, so there was either two or three hives that I could sample, um, which were all next to each other in, um, in one location. Um, and to make it complicated, those isotopic values measured in those samples um, definitely varied. Um, so from one in the same location, even the oxygen hydrogen samples could be very different, even though we sampled it on the same day from the same location and they were analyzed and processed in the lab in the same way at the same date. Um, so what we don't know, if we think about the fractionation that I showed earlier on, um, how it goes from rainwater through the plant, through the bee, through the hive to the jar of honey, what we don't know is how each of those steps influences the results that we're showing here. Um, so I've made a start with the isoscope, isoscape for UK honey, um, which uh, nobody's ever done before. Um, and it's a good start to try and identify what we need to do um, to identify where these samples have come from and what the isotopic values in these different samples mean. Um, and then in combination with that DNA analysis or the municipal analogy, as well as the trace elements, is how they're all going to link together to make fingerprints of each of these honeys, basically, to, um, um, to see where they've come from. So, in summary, um, the DNA and traditional pollen counting do show similarities, but also pick up different families. Uh, the oxygen, hydrogen isotopes, they show significant relationship with the isotopes from precipitation 
which is uh, related to their geographic origin. Um, and trace elements will be looked at next in combination with all other analyzed data to see if this creates an even stronger relationship with the um, geographic origin of the honeysuckles. And that's me done. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, Ayla. That's, uh, that's wonderful. Gosh, you, um, you covered an awful lot of ground there. Well done. <laughs> um, I just, uh, we have, of course, got quite a few questions in. Um, I think a lot of them deal actually with the sensitivity of the techniques and the extent to which you think ultimately you may be able to pin something down to, you know, a, a specific area, whether it be a county or um, even, you know, something smaller than that. Um, so obviously that's the main question of my PhD, to what level can we distinguish them? Um, so the oxygen hydrogen isotopes so far have been, have been good at um, showing the extremes worldwide. Um, not that much on a UK level, um, but I haven't analysed all data yet to combine it into one model, including the trace elements um, too. So we're hoping that by combining um, several different techniques that might be able to distinguish the honeys to, me, to, me, to be able to um, pinpoint it to a smaller location than, uh, than what we're doing now. And what I tried to say with um, my slide about what does this all mean, trying to, I don't have time for this in my PhD, this was enough work as it is, but there's so much scope for future research to try and understand all these different steps in how honey is made by bees so the, how the isotopic signals change from rainwater to plant, how do the plants then turn that into nectar? Do they do that all differently? And therefore is the isotopic signals in the plant or nectar gonna all be different? And so there's there's still so much to do, but this is a good start. Yeah. Yes, I, I found the uh, right at the beginning when you were talking about the, um, the Melissa Palynology versus the DNA barcoding that there were some quite significant differences there. Um, and I, I was also reading an article where they were talking about some of the uncertainties in the DNA, in that first of all, you have to get the DNA out of, out of the pollen grain and some things are more resistant than others. You yeah. haven't got it out. It's the extent to which you, um, you break it down before you try and amplify the DNA. So the, it, it's not, you know, we tend to think perhaps that it's the most reliable method, but there are definite sample preparation issues about DNA barcoding. And, it, and it's also the same, um, I would say, I think for, for the traditional counting too, how somebody handles the sample and which method they use to mount the slides um, and how good your own identification skills are. So um, yeah. the, D the DNA barcoding might get it wrong every now and again, and we might get it wrong every now and again. So, and that's why I'm saying that we need to think about how, how we're gonna combine both methods, if at all, and how we're using that data in future research to, to pinpoint yes. a, a sample, yeah. Yes, as I think you've, you've pointed out, by bringing different techniques to bear on the same problem and each having their own particular view, you build up a much more powerful picture of what's going on. Yeah. One of the questions asks whether we should be working towards sort of Appalachian Contrôlé um, for honey. And, you know, but the current methods, of course, don't pick up any of this stuff, do they? So what does this mean? You know, the, uh, sort of the you know, like for wine, it, there's all oh, right, on con control A, you know, the um, and uh, but uh, it, like a quality assurance, quality assurance, yes. So it's difficult, isn't it? Because, um, for example, with um, some of the trace elements that we uh, we analyzed, um, I won't go into too much detail, but there was there was a couple with some levels of elements in there that you think not really 100% sure if that would come through, if that would pass a food uh, standards agency levels, to be <laughs> honest. Um, but there is no quality control there because anybody can harvest honey in their garden and sell it at the local farmer's market. So there, there's no, there, there, like you say, there is no rules, and but that would be a whole different kettle of fish. <laughs> 
Yes. You weren't able to check any Chinese honeys, were you? No, we didn't have any. No, the Vietnam one was the only one. Although I have to say I had two that um, claimed to be from New Zealand. Um, and then everything I did, they plotted right among all my UK honeys. So I've, I've thrown those out of the analysis because I'm not convinced they're from New Zealand. Yes. OK. Well, I think that uh, I've see if I've got any more questions that I can put to you. Um, little, 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 little. I think, that, you know, there's questions around the addition of corn syrup and that wasn't really a focus on your research at the moment, is it? The adulteration side, it was more the geography. So to make it really, really short, the detection of adulteration with syrups you can do by using uh, carbon isotopes so you would analyze the carbon isotopes in bulk honey and you would analyze the uh, carbon isotope from the protein that you can extract from the honey and then you can detect whether it's been adulterated um, with because there's different photosynthetic pathways and you can detect one of them but not the other so for example addition of beet sugar syrup you can't detect through carbon isotope analysis but for example corn sugar you can um, so if then the difference between the carbon isotopic ratios in the bulk versus the protein is vastly different they've added something to it um, yeah. so we've we've done it for some samples but that wasn't the main um, focus of my research right well <laughs> <laughs> I hope that made sense. <laughs> it's lovely. Thank you very much. Well, it's been a wonderful uh, start to this evening. Thank you very much again, Ayla. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed. Bees, bees, hark to your bees.